and the court. Okay, I think we're on. I think we're live. Uh, welcome everybody to Green Apple Books and Music in San Francisco's first online author event featuring Bonnie Sue, Daniel Handler, and Andrew Sean Greer. Um, they're going to be discussing Bonnie's new book, Why We Swim, among other things. And um, I'm going to let them take it away from here and I'm going to try and disappear. And um, please write any questions you might have for any of the three presenters and uh, they will try and get to it at some point. Have fun, you guys. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Uh, hello. I'm your Hi, captain. Daniel. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Daniel Haller, and thank you for attending. Um, I'm seeing 104 participants, which is fantastic um, for a book that is very uh, dear to my heart. And we appreciate people um, coming out by staying in and logging on to a confusing thing. There's the book, uh, Why We Swim by uh, Bonnie Soy. Uh, she is a journalist and longtime contributor to the New York Times. That's where I first came across her work. And uh, this new book, uh, Why We Swim, is a cultural and scientific explanation of our human relationship with water and swimming. Uh, her parents met in a swimming pool in Hong Kong, which is like, I feel like we have to start there. <laughs> Origin story. Um, I have a, a pretty good photo that I want to show you all. Oh, nice. Oh, sorry. Hang on. <laughs> Babes. Yeah. I think my mom's watching. I'm not doing that just because my mom's watching. Hi, mom. <laughs> I'm crushing out deeply on both of them. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, what, that, is that a photograph of when they met? It is early on. So my dad was um, a lifeguard at a pool. So this is at the beach in Hong Kong. But um, they met in a swimming pool and my dad was a lifeguard there. My mom was a swimmer. My mom was an excellent swimmer. She didn't need anyone to save her. But um, we definitely um, got our love of swimming, a lifetime of that from them. And like we, my brother and I grew up um, on the swim team. We became lifeguards like our dad. And, um, and so it's definitely where it all started. Um, but I think that the frame of the book is that personal story. But because I'm a journalist, I had to find other stories that are better <laughs> and fill and fill in the the you know the structure of the book is you know the question is of course why we swim but it's also um, you know first and foremost it's survival it's we swim so that we can survive the water and then once we can do that we you know swimming can become so much more to us and so it can become well-being you know a, a way to find health and healing. Um, community through a team through the dolphin club which you will be talking about i hope today um and competition and flow and so there's all these and and also i think i want to say right now a, a way of finding escape i mean we at least for me it's always been a wonderful place to immerse myself the water is and and just have no one and nothing touch me for a while other than the water just to be there having that physical relationship to the water as well as mental. And did you tell me about your childhood swimming, particularly with a mom who was a strong swimmer? Like, did you have that yeah. in connection? Uh, well, obviously we started swimming because my parents were afraid that we were gonna drown. And so, I mean, it was like, but, you know, my mom is very practical. My dad is a little more dreamy, but she said, you know, if they're gonna go swim in the neighbor's pool, or you know in the bathtub uh they're gonna take lessons so we started swimming really early like five and six and um yeah like we, and then we took lessons and then we joined the swim team when we were eight or so yeah <laughs> so, and, I, and my, my own kids now are seven and nine and i have you know made them do that because it's in my dna to do it um and um did you, but I mean, did you feel uh, immediately a powerful connection to the water? I mean, I was a very, I also, you know, was taught to swim because yeah, I'm going to drown and here we are in California. Um, and my mom actually kind of, she can swim a little bit, but she uh -huh. felt like she needed, she missed that air, that time where she got a real fluency in the water and she right. didn't want to 
um, that. So my sister and I had swimming lessons from a really young age, but we both really took to it. I mean, we yeah. both, you know, were like endlessly puckered. We were the kids who were like being Cooney. yelled at adult stuff. Right? Just, <laughs> get out of the water now and have a sandwich. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> like blue that, lips, pretty fingers. That, yeah, 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 yeah. We, um, we went to Jones Beach a lot. Um, so I grew up in New York and we went to Jones Beach and we would spend days, like long afternoons out there. Just, um, yeah, we would, we would jump up and down on the waves and then we would run back to the hotel and then we would jump up and down the waves and run back to the hotel. And that was just like the rhythm of that. Like I think about it and it puts me immediately back in that space. And it's just really, it's it's very it's very cool to suddenly be back there. Even now, as I'm talking about it, that I know that I'm just there. Yeah. Um, actually, I I realized that we forgot to talk about these. Oh, do tell. Um, do tell. So my friend Anna, um, she knows this wonderful designer in London, who Alexander Brown. And she said, you need to get these swim tiles for your book. And so Alex, Alex made these tiles for the book, especially for Why We Swim. And so everyone who pre-orders the book at Green Apple um, today gets entered into a giveaway because oh. we promised free stuff uh, for one of um, three tiles that uh, we have. So I just wanted to float that out there. Which I feel like, being as we're having this conversation with cocktails, we should say that they may serve as coasters. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes, right here. You don't have to you say to yourself, see, but... well, three tiles, that's not enough to completely redo my bathroom. You can say to yourself, no, I am going to buy why we swim. They're decorative. They're decorative. <laughs> um, and so what was the, um, I mean, you have written a, a about a wide variety of topics for the time, certainly. And I'm curious um, how it was to approach this while having such a strong personal connection to the material. Um, it was really hard. It was actually, I thought about the structure for a long ass time. And it, um, because I started, I, once I decided that I wanted to write a book about swimming, and, you know, obviously when you write one book, everyone wants to know what the next one is. And I, a long, for a long time, I didn't know what that was. Ooh. You probably had a whole train of them in front of you when someone asked you that, but I did not. <laughs> I did not know what was on the horizon. So I knew that I wanted to write a book about swimming, but I didn't know what form it would take. And so when I finally decided that I was going to do it, I started gathering stories. And so it was just sort of this amorphous blob of just great stories, but I didn't know how to organize it. And then a really smart editor friend of mine said, why don't you just call it something very simple, like why we swim? And it just, I kid you not, it was like a religious moment where everything just like fell into these five thematic baskets. And then it was just like, oh, and then it, it just made sense. Like it all then, you know, there was a narrative flow through the book from survival all the way to flow. And all of those threads, you know, came together. Um, oh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Special uh, guest? Role, who's terrified of the water. Um, yes, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah. Co-captain. <laughs> um, so, uh, I think your book is like the great book about swimming. Many people have approached this book and uh, I have approached this topic and it can either be kind of endlessly historical and scientific and often I think um, lightly scientific in a way that people who aren't scientists a couple of articles and then write a book. Um, and I think you really managed to capture the essence of this um, very emotional and dare I say even spiritual experience that happens from um, swimming in large bodies of water. And um, I know uh, me and our other guest, Andrew Sean Greer, who is having some technological <laughs> But he and I swim together a lot uh, at yeah. the Bay Dolphin Club. And um, I know it has been kind of life-changing experiences for both of us. And so it's one of the reasons I was so excited about this book is that um, I think if you're a writer and you do this kind of swimming, you have this fantasy that you could write a book about it. And so for me, the book was not only a joy, but like this enormous sigh of relief of like, oh, finally, someone else <laughs> <laughs> have to 
to worry about it anymore. Um, but did you feel, I mean, I would, I would have felt a lot of trepidation about writing about this. Uh -huh. thing. It is really enormous. It has oh, hell yes. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, um, I, I started to think about, um, early on in the process, I thought about, there's so many books about running, right? Yeah. I think of Born to Run as a sort of gold standard of a book that kind of pulls together um, all these narrative threads and the emotional stuff and and just the grander view of of our human relationship with something um, uh, physical like that right yeah, uh, and um but there are also there are so many so there are so many books about like you know the mechanics of running the history of running the evolution but you know science and um, I, I started thinking about why and wondering why there wasn't a, a swimming book, a book that did that for swimming, um, that had a narrative. Because um, I wanted to tell not just, I, I didn't want it to be a personal story. You know, my story is just a frame. I'm the guide to bring you to these people and stories, right, in the outside world that resonate, I think, on a larger scale. And, um, I wanted to make that book, and I think that once I settled on that structure, and then having themes to um, kind of knock about in, and 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 have a bits of history and, and bits of evolution, uh, sorry, um, of science, and but also really that like very human character-driven um, story in each section that to anchor it, and so. You know, I I didn't know if it was going to succeed. I was scared of it, um, but I wanted to try, and and I knew that I wanted to try when I couldn't stop thinking about it. Yeah, over years, <laughs> yeah. years and years and years. That's how they get you. That's how the right. Yeah, yeah. They're like, forget about money, forget about all that other. Just you, you yeah. have to write it. Right. Are you doing something that you should be focusing on, but you're thinking about something else? That's when you know you're trapped and you got to write a book. Um, uh, do you have, is there a favorite story of yours in the book? There's so many good ones, but, and I don't want to, um, give them all away. Um, you know, I think, um, Barbara also wants to know that. Barbara, Barbara wants to know. Barbara wants to know. Wait, let me see what Barbara wants to know. She said, I love to swim and would love to hear I your favorite, favorite story. Story. That's really hard. That's like, you know, your kids choosing a you but, um, they're, so the opening story of the book is um, a story that my husband told me one night over dinner. And it's about this Icelandic fisherman who one winter night in 1984 fell overboard in um, off his fishing vessel off the coast of Iceland. And he, he swam, everyone died. He swam six hours in 41 degree water. So 41 degree water, you may be last. 20 minutes, 30 minutes max. Hypothermia yeah. will claim you, you will drown. Um, he swam for six hours. And um, not only that, he when he got to the coast of this island that he is from, it's a it's a it's an archipelago, it's lava formed. Um, he hit these cliffs of like hundred and feet, hundred feet, couldn't get out, had to get back in and swim again. And then it's just, you know, walking across this spiky lava field and he gets to, across the snow and finally gets to town and they take him to a hospital and they cannot find his heartbeat um and he but he's not showing any signs of hypothermia and he's only a little dehydrated and so it turns out that this man um his name is Gundlaugur Fridthorsen but his nickname is Loye so everyone calls him Loye um he his body resembled a seal in that his body fat was um, like two to three times normal human thickness. And so it kept his core warm. And anyone who swims in the bay knows yeah. that that would really help you because the, you know you, you can swim for a while, but then you're, you start, um, you know, the, the after drop, actually you get out of the water, you may feel fine, but your core temperature keeps dropping. And so in the, in the, in the shower, this is what I experienced, some of you guys, 
is that um, hot water is coming and you're still shaking. You can't control yourself because you're, you have mild hypothermia. Yeah, this like effect of being in the cold water um, just like takes over your body. And he, but he, he was fine because of that. And he, it turns out from this biological quirk that he was, you know, more marine mammal than terrestrial, that um, he was able to survive this and became famous the world over. He did all these, um, you know, medical uh, research experiments and was like that story to me was the siren song that said, I want something like that. And then I end up, the first part of the book is about him. And he's this very reclusive guy, but um, he became very important and um, uh, an important and good friend of my family's, you know, over the course of writing this book. And he, um, but his story was such that uh, it reminded me that we're not so far removed from the sea. And I wanted that, some of that magic to infiltrate the book. Yeah. Um, it's also, it's a really, uh, it's a scary story when you read yeah, it. Yeah, it's a very scary story. Uh, and I think that um, there's nobody who hasn't been in swimming in open water for a while who doesn't have a scary story. This is another mm -hmm. question, but it's something I wanted to talk to you about because I have had, I mean, I haven't, I've been swimming in the bay, I guess about five years and mm -hmm. I have had two really terrifying experiences. <gasps> Hi, and Andy. <laughs> experience of having Mr. Andrew Shangir join us. Hello, Andy. <laughs> Wait, are you muted? I can't tell. Yeah, you might be muted. <laughs> We're making some slow progress. Uh, How but many writers does it take to do a year? My uh, swimming partner often at the Dolphin Club. Um, but I wanted to ask you about that because you have had your own scary experiences as well. Yeah. Which I think, um, enabled you to write very well about these uh, experiences. Because I think some people who have not swum in open water kind of yeah. feel like, well, you fall off a boat and then you swim and you climb yourself up on a rock and you go out to lunch later. That was definitely something that I wanted to talk to both of you about um, this evening because uh, that is just an entirely, um, to dance near that border, right? That porousness between states, I guess, is what I describe it in the book, uh, how I describe it in the book. There's something very um, sobering about it, but also it makes you feel so alive to get close to death, right? And, and that's why we love survival stories. We love, um, we want to know what someone who gets close to that edge has to report back to us, right? And so when we feel ourselves, I mean, I, every time I go out at Ocean Beach, every time I go out open water swimming, I, ha I, I always feel a sense of that. Some, even if it's not a huge overwhelming sense of that, um, it is always there. It is never gone when I swim in open water. And um, yeah. Yeah. I, I assume it's the same for you both. Uh, certainly, yeah. I mean, it's... Um... It's funny because you said that's what's so appealing about those um, nature and terror stories. And um, I was kind of the opposite. Whenever I heard a story like that, like whenever I read Into the Wild or I heard other stories, uh -huh. kind of that I was of course engrossed and often sympathetic, but I also had this thing of like, do not do that. Don't climb up <laughs> in the land. It's crazy. Like, like, I'm sorry that that happened to you, but here it is. And then when I was swimming in the open water and something scary happened to me, that was one of my thoughts, like literally while it was happening, I thought, oh, this is why. Like you have this connection and you want to do this thing. And the fact that a scary thing might happen to you turns out to be not a deterrent to doing it. Uh -huh. And I'm not generally a brave person. So it took me a while to kind of actually manage that calculus. And I think that you, mm -hmm. you portray that very well in your book that um, it's, it is a very, it's a very dangerous world to go out and swim yeah. in the ocean. Um, and maybe yeah. now we're having this conversation and we're forced to have it because we live in a dangerous world right this very second, it can be more kind of relatable that we all know, we're gonna go to, well, we all know that we're gonna go to a restaurant again. We're not gonna stop, you know, we're gonna go again. <laughs> we're gonna so hug people, we're gonna wanna be near them. Like, yeah, and yeah. so, um, I think you handled that um, 
that edge very closely. Have you had a scary experience yourself that you want to tell us? Because we know those stories are so engrossing. Oh, heck yeah. Um, I feel like I don't know if there's one that I can point to right now because there have been many of them. <gasps> I mean, I'm not like crazy. I'm not a daredevil, but it's just that, you know, the feeling at least. I don't know. Andy, do you have one that you want to share? Well, I mean, I remember early on when Daniel and I started swimming, we had sort of, we would love to swim out to the opening, which uh -huh, is right uh -huh. there. You, you sort of right at the edge of the protected cove and you're getting out into the bay itself under, in front of Alcatraz. And that's where the water is could take mm -hmm. you anywhere. And we just wanted to look at um, Golden Gate Bridge and the tide kind of turned on us and we were suddenly finding ourselves not able to get back in. Yeah. And uh, it turns out we could have just gone down to the next pier and gone, you know, mm -hmm. like we wouldn't have died. Mm -hmm. but, it, but the mm -hmm. feeling was, and I remember Daniel said at the end of it, he was like, oh, this is how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was very nonchalant. I find you very brave out there, Daniel. Uh, well, you know, the line between bravery and stupidity is always thin, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, the, the scariest experience that I had is that I, so um, I swim regularly at the Dolphin Club and mm -hmm. uh, Andy often swims with me. And um, we, I mean, I would say open water swimming. There are a lot of things like this, but open water swimming is one of them that is like drinking, that everybody who does it less than you is no fun, and everybody who does it more than you has a problem. <laughs> like, most people in the world, yeah, exactly. So most people in the world um, <laughs> think that, uh, that it's crazy to swim in open water anyway. But then by the standards of the Dolphin Club, Andy and I are both yeah. very, very conservative swimmers. Yeah. Yeah. Other people are crazy. But I went and took a friend once, and she had swum with me in very warm water. Uh huh. She hadn't swum with me here. And so I said, Well, we're going to be very careful. And we took this very careful route. And then she said, I really want to do more. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't feel right to me, but she was my friend, and we'd swum together and, you know, let people make their own choices. And so we went out, and the tide was against us. And, and, mm -hmm. and she Oh, it's so beautiful, and thank you for taking me out here. And I said, uh-huh, uh-huh, it's time to go back now. we got to go back. And we went back, and it was really, really hard. And then she nudged me, and so I stopped swimming, and I turned to look at her, and she said, I'm not going to make it. And I, I was like, what do you mean you're not going to make it? That's not a, like, <laughs> you're not, like, backing out of a pub crawl or something. <laughs> like, you know, you're not leaving early at a rock show because the opening band was so terrible that you want to go home. <laughs> like you got, there's no other try. You have to make it. And um, she went. She swam. She kind of left the water and swam and swam over to the um, seawall where she grabbed onto uh -huh. this like cement like, tiling. Barnacle covered. Yeah. It. it was already ripping her, and I realized that she was um, irrational because of hypothermia. Yeah. And I was. Oh my god, really that's so scary. scary. I my concentration had been like, I'm just going to keep her morale up. And then we're both going to go back into the water. And now I thought, I do not know what to do. I was, yeah. And that was a very, you know, that was like the elevator falling inside you feeling. It was really, really scary for me. And um, it worked out fine. But um, but I just remember, and because, because hypothermia will kind of rob you of reason sometimes, mm -hmm. when we were in safety, she like had a donut and she was like, okay, that was kind of crazy, but that was fun. You know, and I was like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> she and has so a kind of foggy, worked. gauzy memory of it. <laughs> yeah. Like she was like, well, it turned out fine. I was like, hey, wait, is that one's never going to be fine again. It was a horrible. <laughs> I, feel like need, I feel like we need to paint a little bit more of a vivid picture for people who don't know where we're talking about around Aquatic Park and the seawall. And once you kind of like push out through this little um you know that opening into the open bay that you get out you know you're swimming here it's calm and then you swim through this little keyhole and then it's like either the current is <laughs> taking you out the golden gate yeah. or it's rushing you into the bay and so it's it's like if you stop swimming it's it's like this <laughs> like an uh you know uh, uh, a 
conveyor belt. So yeah. if you don't time the tides right. Um, it's the difference between kind of um, running on an outdoor track, uh -huh. right? It's outdoors and it's beautiful, but it is a track that someone has built or just like running into the woods. You know, and that and that's what it feels like. So there's a little. If you live in yeah. San Francisco, and you've ever visited one of the historical ships or gone to Ghirardelli Square, you've probably seen this area that has a lot of boats in it, and that's where people swim. Mm -hmm. And it's very protected. It's still um, there's still danger of hypothermia, and it still can be super challenging. But it is a kind of hemmed in area, and then you can go out, and that's the bay, and um, you're at the mercy of the tides, and you're at the mercy of enormous ships. You know, there's a lot of the bay is a working port, and the um, the sea lions. Uh, yeah, there and the then sea lions. Yeah, yeah sea lions <laughs> and seals. Yeah, ships don't pay attention to you, and the sea lions yeah. and seals kind of might pay attention to you, which is its whole other terror. Um, uh, Kristen Rubin writes in. Uh, actually, she writes in and then says, "Hi, my name is Karen." So I don't know if it's Kristen Rubin or Karen. My apologies. <laughs> Continuing with the theme of fear, I have both a profound love and a spirit connection with the open water and also carry with me strong abstract fears of creatures in the dark unknown of the water. What have you learned about that kind of more abstract fear that seems a companion to the love of water? And she, I mean, I think she hits that nail on the head. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very um, beautiful. But there's something deep and spooky about what you don't know about underwater. Yeah, I mean, you'd be swimming along and you'll hit seaweed or what you think is and hope is seaweed and there is an instinct I just remember the first time I swam from Alcatraz to Aquatic Park and I'm swimming and then I hit the seaweed and before I can't it's not even a thought in my brain there's no thought in my brain except my body just rears back and jerks yeah. back because that is that is how visceral it is yeah and, it's like, um, twig snapping when you're camping yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like one <laughs> snaps and you're like, I'm surrounded by bears. This is the end. We're all gonna die. Yeah, <laughs> and really, it's and like an ache rolling over. So, like a rational person might ask, why? Why are you doing this, yeah. friend? <laughs> Tell us. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's. I, I mean, I think what you you strike very very well in Why We Swim, available at Green Apple Books. Um, you strike this, um, I, I think you really lead us to an understanding of how um, certain people's connection to the water when they find it like this is entirely irrational and goes um, at some deeper or even instinctive level mm -hmm. that really cannot be rationalized away. And I think it's with all, I think it's with all kind of all the enormous choices we make in life, right? Like right. love is not worth it. You fall in love with someone and that is the person that you will yell at hardest in your whole life and be yelled at hardest in your whole life. And um, that's a strange thing to know. And yet we're all gonna do it. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, to me that feels like a very similar connection. Mm -hmm. um, Andy, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think I've always um, shied away from any of the sports that involve putting yourself in danger and retrieving yourself from that danger as the purpose mm -hmm. of the sport. As I, skiing is, is one <laughs> that I think of that <laughs> way. Uh, and uh, I somehow can't overcome my fear to relax enough to do the sport itself. But swimming, because you take yourself out there and then coming back is um, is uh, so necessary <laughs> that you have to do it. And then I find myself like really pleased that this is the one sort of somewhat scary sport that I could can conquer. And I feel amazing at the end of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I yeah. haven't done anything like what you've done, Bonnie, you know. I don't know. I mean, the stories you guys are telling about being out there in the bay together. <laughs> I haven't done that as many times as you. And every time I do it, it's terrifying. It really is. Because even though I know that I'm supposed to be cutting this angle, the tide is starting to shift, so I've got to do this. It's still like the, like the quickness with that, with that swing is always alarming to me. 
And I know that I'm a strong swimmer. I just don't know if I'm going to make, I, I, I can put my head in that space where your friend who's just like, I don't think I'm going to make it back. I mean, it, it, it is like a thing that's knocking around in there. It's, um, it's also an enormous counter argument, I think, to the instinctive egotism that human beings have. Yeah. Things I feel, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes there's a little chalkboard at the Dolphin Club and before you go into the water, you can read the temperature and which way the tide is going and when the tide came in and when it came out and you can read these uh -huh. things. And you get out there sometimes and, you know, the ocean hasn't read that chart. <laughs> <laughs> Not subscribing to your promise that is written with nothing but the best of intentions on a chalkboard is actually entirely irrelevant to the situation that you're in. And I just think in a world, um, you know, increasingly in such a privileged location as San Francisco, and we're all kind of first worlders living here. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, there is a silent <laughs> um, uh, anyway, in the world of swimming first world, uh, ballet here. <laughs> Yeah. That is the interlude. <laughs> yeah. So now we have some very special guests. Who are going to be Feel like doing... some teddy, everyone. Feel like some yeah. teddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's All just right. to remind us of time. We've got some more time, a little bit of time left to take uh, more questions. Because as they dance, so they're going to dance behind you? What's going to happen? They, they, uh, they did that, and then now they're gone. Well, that was it. Yeah, it's, that's good. It was that's not a planned good. thing. It was just a, uh, yeah. uh, you know. Like, I was oh up for five minutes <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, but um, I'm so I'm scrolling through some of the questions, some of which more or less have been answered. Um, there are definitely some people who are curious about the Dolphin Club versus the South End Club, which are Ooh. the swim clubs in San Francisco, which share a um, building and are nevertheless philosophical opposites. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we should mention that uh, Pete, who is our host today at uh, Green Apple Books, is a member of the South End Club. So we have nothing but respect and admiration for whatever choice you make, except that the Dolphin Club is clearly superior <laughs> and the South End Club is just a bunch of miserable low lives. But other than that... <laughs> well, you've got like two versus... Uh, Pete is mute right now, so he can't speak for himself. But I will also speak for, say, Kim Chambers, who is a prominent character in the book. She said she was a middle child, and she's a member of both clubs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way to do it, maybe. I don't know. Is that even allowed? Do you let her do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, um, the, I will say that I think what is super interesting is that um, I had this kind of vague desire to start swimming more in the open water. And when I came across in the Dolphin Club and the South End Club is this very intense subculture. So it's almost as if, you know, one day you decide you're going to grow orchids and then you meet everyone from the orchid thief. You know, you meet this <laughs> that's going on. And, um, and it's a, I've never been part of a subculture that had a very specific thing in common and kind of nothing else in common. Mm -hmm. I think there's something so beautiful about that. Yeah. Me and too. So, I really like, I mean. Andy can talk to it. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a joiner. I don't, probably none of us really are. And so having been sort of led into this group, I love it because there's something, uh, I, you know, funny and, macho about the men and the women about you know <laughs> fraternal yeah, they're, they're it's funny it's, it's like an environment I've fled from all my life of like sort of like towels whipping in the locker room kind of thing that I think is hilarious <laughs> that's, that's where I am I, but I really it's all like in this like there's that but there, it's all so loving and it's so obviously loving you know even the whole thing with like you're not supposed to wear wetsuits like if anyone shows up in a wetsuit, you're like, yes, come in, come swim with us. It's not like that. It's not um, exclusive. And I think that, um, I mean, to take it a little bit, expand it a bit outside of um, Dolphin Club, South End, just open water swimming and just the swimming in general and, and like locker rooms. Um, my friend Leslie wants to know about, um, you know, talking a little bit about the, the, the sort of camaraderie of, I mean, I, 
have always wanted to, I've been meaning to write this essay about locker rooms because there is something about the, the, um, what I experience in the locker room that's like this, this tableau on aging and it's all these different bodies and, um, you know, and you're also like kind of like mashed up against each other and it's sort of awkward, you're putting on, you know, and it's, it's not, it's unlovely. It's very awkward, but it's just also something very wonderful about the, um, you don't care. You're, it's just, you're just there and you're, you're literally naked with each other. And then you'll be out on the street and um, Daniel, you and I have talked about this where you don't recognize someone with their clothes on. <laughs> you don't know who those people are. And you say, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. I just, you know, I really like literally did not recognize you with your clothes on. Um, yeah. And that you don't know anyone. You don't. <laughs> in some situation, you know, I just saw someone actually right kind of before the lockdown, one of my last uh -huh. little restaurants mm -hmm. um, is that I walked into one and there was someone in the dolphin club there. And my first thought was like, I didn't know you went to restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> you exist only there. He totally does. <laughs> he doesn't just swim. Yeah. But it is, it is like seeing your dentist at a nightclub or something. <laughs> um, you guys, we have a couple minutes left. And as I've been monitoring the questions coming in, there were just a couple that I wanted to get to. One is for Bonnie specifically. Um, someone asked you if you could talk about um, the samurais who swim vertically or something. Is oh yes, <laughs> samurai swimming. Okay, this is a this is going to take up too much time, but I'm going to make it really quick. Japan has a tradition of samurai swimming, and that is basically think about the uh, the martial the Japanese martial art swimming martial art. Nobody knows about it. It's like judo or kendo, and it is the swimming part of it. And um, there are levels you can become a master as well. And I went to Japan to learn about it. Um, I was really excited with the Olympics because they're actually, uh, they were planning an exhibition of uh, this classical swimming tradition at the Olympics and of course it's been postponed next year. Hopefully we will all get to see that next summer. Um, but it was this magical, I mean, think about it, it, just the, the, the zen of swimming and then it's like, you know, subsumed into this, like what was originally um, a martial art that, that the samurai clans had um, different styles of swimming that evolved to protect these different parts of Japan if they lived on the coast, if they lived on the lake, if they lived in rivers, and to protect their feudal lands. And so they evolved all these different techniques to, um, one of my favorites is that they can, you know, they can quietly tread water. Actually, that egg beater technique is a uh, basis of synchronized swimming today. But that was like in samurai scrolls like hundreds of years ago. And so they would do this quiet egg beater. And then you can shoot an arrow. They would be able to do all these things, like write on scrolls and shoot arrows and stuff. And it's, or wear like many pounds, 25 pounds of um, armor. Read the book. There's so much. I want to tell you, but I can't. <laughs> Read the book. Read the book. Read the book. <laughs> it's an astonishing part of the book. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I often say this at the end of uh, book events, and so I will say it now, that I have a very narrow list of um, spiritual beliefs. But one of them is that if you enter the space of an independent bookstore and you leave without buying a book, you're committing a sin. <laughs> so, We're in that space right here. We are the audience. <laughs> um, you, Green Apple can check their uh, uh, received orders. I ordered a bunch of books from Green Apple today because I knew that if I were at Green Apple Books right now and I were doing this event, I would have a lovely time. And then there'd be a big long line for Bonnie to sign her book and I would wander the shelf and I would end up spending $75. And so uh, pretend you're at a book event now, uh, please get in line and buy Bonnie's wonderful book about swimming, Why We Swim, which will enter you into a drawing to uh, win some coasters or as some people call them, tiles. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you don't even have to stand in line. You just do it. You just do it. <laughs> That's right. And um, uh, and while you're at it, why not purchase something else, the Green Apple Books, which is happy to mail you books. I happen to know that you're stuck in your home. I happen to know that you don't have enough to read. And I happen to know that you should be supporting Green Apple Books and not committing what is, in my mind, an egregious sin. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> don't be that person, false invisible people. So, thanks so much about <laughs> coming out uh and thank uh, you daniel thank you andy thank you sam
<laughs> Thank you all so <laughs> much. Love you. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye-bye.